Good afternoon. Morning. <laughs> Got you. Good thing you're listening. <laughs> wait. We praise God for uh, such a wonderful time of worship. Thank you, music team, for leading us. You know, those are amazing songs. And I also thank everyone for the pastor's appreciation. This is a little bit delayed response to that, but I do thank you uh, for what you did uh, two weeks ago, uh, the work you've done, especially on the video. I know there's some, a lot of effort has been done there. Maybe sleepless nights. I'm not sure. <laughs> you know, I don't really deserve that kind of appreciation. If you know who I am, if you know my, who I am, my, my heart, you know, I, I don't deserve that because, you know, everything that I do is only by God's grace. And according to his wisdom, you know, I cannot give to you what, what uh, it's not from me unless God gives it to me. You know, what I receive from God is the only thing that I can give to you. You know, sometimes uh, in ministry, I know some of you in ministry can attest to this, you know. Um, sometimes you have a lot of plans on what you want to do for ministry, but in the end, sometimes... Uh, you, you're so pressured that you just work on it the night before. You figure out things on the last minute. I know the kitchen ladies, when they prepare their food, sometimes it's just the night you want to prepare this. Uh, you know, you think that they were like, oh, I need to really make this work, make this all organized. But in the end, oh, you just have to do what you, do, you need to do. Get pizza. <laughs> we need to have pizza. You know, last minute stuff. But I praise God that this really, this is a good reminder for all of us, you know, um, that in ourselves, you know, though we are unworthy to be used by God, even myself, but God chooses to use us because uh, He is good and gracious, and our the appreciation for what we do really goes, even the appreciation you have for me, it really goes back to the Lord. Amen. It's for Him. It's for His glory. And. And the one thing that I need from this church and everyone, especially not just for me, but all the leaders of this church, is for you to pray for me and all the leaders of this church. Those who are standing in front here, involved in ministry, music leaders, musicians, even our Sunday school teachers, those in the media, uh, youth and children's teachers, pray for them. Please pray for them. Um, they need God's guidance. They need God's wisdom. Yesterday, Randall and Faith did an amazing work in, uh, in teaching our parents and youth yesterday. Praise God for that lesson. Praise God for that lesson. Upon. Uh, and I know all the parents who are here had a, learned something yesterday, right? Randall learned a lot. Um, and when I look at the work that is ahead of us for our church, Think about discipleship, think about the life groups and organizing all these things and growing our life groups and growing our ministry. It's a daunting task. It's a huge task. And sometimes, in fact, many times I'm, I'm overwhelmed. <laughs> and sometimes I ask the Lord, in my thought, I have this thought, Lord, uh, you might need to consider, Lord, finding someone else who is stronger, <laughs> who is more mature. Who is more equipped for to this task, oh God? <laughs> I think you need to be, begin thinking like that, God. <laughs> you know, because not just the challenges of ministry, right? Uh, it's also how the world now is going into, the direction the world is going into. There's so much that's up, up against us. You, some of you might not realize this, but there's really many, many more things that's up against the church, against our kids, against our youth, against Christians today. And it makes ministry more difficult, actually. If we just ignore these things, then you might not be as stressed as me. <laughs> but when I look at the situation, I, I confess I'm anxious and I feel stress. But of course, I need to rest on God to depend on Him to help us through this. You know, false teachings infiltrating churches today. You know, I was just looking at the stat. Reynolds showed some stats yesterday. I also have my stats today. Okay? I don't have the slide because I didn't have time to put it together. But, but there was a, stat that, uh, a study done by Ligonier Ministry a few years ago, like in the 2020s or 2021. And there, had a couple of, there was a couple of questions about theology. 
related to theology, actually. In fact, the statistics is, is entitled The State of Theology. And this was directed, I th probably some of you have seen this, and, and, some, and this stat was directed to uh, people across the country, sampled people across the country, not just Christians, non-Christians as well. And one of the statistics was, there's a couple, but I'm just going to highlight one, is that all kinds of worship, one of the questions is all, kind of, all kinds of worship is acceptable to God, meaning the worship of a Muslim, the worship of a Hindu, worship of different religions around the world, probably even, even Church of Satan, whatever kind of worship. The, 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 the question is, is all kinds of worship is acceptable to God? And of course, the general answer across every one is that around, I know it was around 70%, or I'm trying to recall what the exact number was, but around that number, um, said, yes, all kinds of worship, acceptable to God. But here's the problem. When you drill down to just evangelical, quote-unquote evangelical Christians, it is close to 60%. 60%. Listen to this, 60% of people identify as Christians, evangelical Christians, says that all kinds of worship is acceptable to God. That is really bad. Really, really bad. It's a flawed view, understanding of the Bible. Meaning every person that says they're Christians today, you cannot trust their theology. You cannot trust what they believe. It's a dangerous situation because they don't really agree with the Bible 100%. And that's why any person who says they're a Christian, I cannot really say that they truly know what the Word of God is. Knowing that 60% thinks like that, they have a flawed idea of who God is and what the Bible expects. And so we Christians, we need to be watchful. Every blog we read, every sermon we listen from any prominent pastor is a suspect. Every song we sing here needs to be scrutinized because there's flawed teachings here that could infiltrate our church and can destroy our faith. Like this song, we removed this song from our list. Like a rose planted on the ground, took the fall, thought of me above. That's a flawed song. Thought of me above all. That's wrong. Jesus didn't die because just because he was thinking of you, that's not the biggest reason. That's not the above all reason, right? The Bible says the reason why Christ on the died on the cross is because of his, for his glory and honor. That is the highest reason why God, Jesus died on the cross is for his glory, not because of you. Of course, he loves us because you know the reason why he died and why he saved us from our sin? Because his glory is, he's, he's, he's not glorified by the situation. Our sin does not glorify him. That's why he died for us. And of course he loves us. But of course the highest reason is his glory. And so there's a lot of songs, very subtle. But it, is, it has a flawed view of, of God and the Bible. Inaccurate. I, I think I would say imp not precise. So, so this is something we'll consider today as we come to this sermon because I entitled my sermon today, Great Faith. Great Faith. Based on Matthew 8, 5 to 13, the passage you just read earlier. But let me pray first before we go on. Lord, uh, we thank you for this day that you are with us. For whether two or three of us gathered in your name, you are right in our midst. But Lord, also you said that that those who come to you, believe in you, Lord, you send the Spirit into our hearts, Spirit that cries out, Abba, Father. And it's the same Spirit I ask, Lord, through your Spirit, that I may speak, Lord, your words, because you're the one who gives the words that I need to say. And you also, Holy Spirit, gives us an understanding. Lord, reveal more than what I say here, Lord God, because I, I'm very limited, Lord God, in what I can do, Lord. But you alone can transform hearts, change lives of God today. And Lord, I pray also that you grant us wisdom in such a time as this, Lord, where, oh God, our faith is being challenged more and more by all kinds of things. Not just outside the church, not just in the workplace, in the schools, Lord. No, our faith is being challenged, oh God. And, and Lord, uh, sometimes we give in, sometimes we... 
get discouraged, and sometimes we compromise, we ask your forgiveness, but there are times we take our stand, Lord, and that is good, oh God, and this, is, this pleases you. This honors you, Lord God. But Lord, at the same time, within the church, oh God, our faith is being challenged because there's a lot of things that's now coming out that is not conforming to the knowledge of you and your word, and it's infiltrating churches and might be infiltrating our lives and our church as well, Lord. And this is one of those things that just makes me anxious, oh God, every day. And I'm anxious of this, oh God, truly, Lord. And help me, Lord, to overcome this and to trust you that you will protect us from such a situation. Oh Lord, help us. You're, I myself as a pastor and all the leaders and teachers and those who minister in this church, help us, Lord. To be precise in our understanding of your word. That we are truly in conformity to the truth. That we, we will not dilute your word. We will not compromise your word, O oh God. Or water down your word, O oh God. Help us, Lord. Correct us, O oh God, if needed, Lord. Our thinking, our lives, our understanding. Lord, in this time of the year we are... Many are, in fact, the country, Lord God, is going to another election. Help us to choose wisely, Lord. Help us to choose someone, Lord God, to lead the different aspects of government, oh God, according to your words and to your will. And Lord, show us, oh God, Lord God, what we need to do on this election, Lord God. We also ask, Lord God, for encouragement upon our brethren, some Oh, God, are struggling with sickness. Some of God Lord, here are struggling with discouragement. Maybe a situation at work or overwhelmed by, oh, God, the demands of life. Oh, God, we ask your grace. We ask your peace. We ask your wisdom. Oh, God, that we will have the strength to deal with different kinds of struggles that we go through, Lord. Some have family that are sick with cancer, Lord, and and, and, Lord, this is a dreadful thing to hear. We, Lord, we pray that you intervene in, the, in that family, Lord, in their lives and bring about the healing that the, that the doctors cannot bring, oh God, cannot do, Lord. Uh, that you alone can do, Lord. Bring about that healing, Lord. Lord, encourage those who are, Lord, giving up, questioning you, Doubting you, Lord, encourage them, change their thinking, grant repentance. Lord, bless the preaching of your word today that indeed this brings, this will bring encouragement, wisdom, spiritual growth, and a change of heart that is more and more conformed to your nature, to your likeness, Lord Jesus. I ask this in your name, amen. Amen. As you notice, this past several weeks, we've been talking about faith, and I'm still in that subject today. And we learned that faith is simply trusting God. And since God has chosen to reveal Himself through His Holy Word, through the Bible, then, in a practical sense, faith is simply trusting God's Word. Amen? That is our Christian definition of faith. Simply trusting the Word of God, trusting God's Word, trusting His promises, trusting Himself, trusting God Himself, His nature, His ways, how He revealed Himself to us. That is what faith is. But this morning, i like for us to look into what great faith is. Not just any kind of faith, but great faith. And, and faith in relation to prayer. And in what, 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 what does... Uh, prayer in great faith or with great faith looks like. Meaning when a person prays and he has great faith in God, was, what does it look like? Well, first of all, I would like to talk about faith and emotions because in our culture today and even in our own personal experience, I can attest to this and I think you can identify with this. We, we often incorrectly Associate faith with emotions, right? When we see someone crying in prayer, when we, saw, we see someone crying in worship, like raising hands, I'm going to show you 
I'm not against any of those crying and raising hands because, in fact, we're commanded by the Bible. But when we, someone with great, when we see someone with great emotion, whether preaching, prayer, worship, whatever situation in the Christian life, we always say, oh, that person is really, he has great faith. <laughs> right? We often think like that. That's the human nature. While feeling or emotions can be an outcome of faith, for instance, you know, you have peace. After a time of prayer, right? There's, that's, that's an emotion. Having peace in your heart, that's an emotion. Also, the th- you have joy, great joy in your heart after a time of fellowship, right? What do you feel when you get out of this church after Sunday? Busog? Of course, that's one of it. <laughs> Bondat? Oh, mga Americano, sorry. Uh, fu- I didn't, fool. <laughs> Im, right? Tama ba yun? Im? Well, <laughs> In in Thai, uh, Thai. Okay, um, you you have feelings, right? Out of out of these exp- kinds of experiences. However, we cannot, and you you should not use feelings as the basis of faith, basis of your faith. When you look at Scripture, when you look at the Bible, as well as the growth of your spiritual life, your growth in Christ. It is centered on one human faculty. It is centered on, on one part. It's gravitating towards one part of the human per, uh, fa- uh, nature or faculty of one faculty of human or the human being, and that is our mind. Utak, our mind. Listen to these ver- verses. Uh, look at these verses in Romans 10, 17, for instance. So faith comes from hearing. And hearing to the word of Christ. So hearing implies understanding, right? Um, Romans 12, 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You can find more more of these verses in Scripture. For instance, 2 Peter 3, 18. But grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In fact, in our men's study, uh, one of the, this was the previous study, not last, not last uh, Thursday, uh, in the pursuit of holiness, Jerry Bridges said these words in his book, God's word speaks to us primarily through reason. You notice that when you read the Bible, when you study the Bible, when you meditate, I'm not saying... 100% of the time, but most of the time. Because sometimes, you know, the Word of God speaks also to your emotions. But, but most of the time, and primarily, He's saying, the Word of God speaks through reason. Through reason, through, through our mind. You know, emotion can be your response to God's Word, but God speaks to our mind first. Agree? Yes, you have to read the Bible, right? It's a mind thing, right? Of course, later on, when it impacts your heart, then that's where an emotion comes in. Not all the time, but sometimes. So he says it's vitally important for our minds to be constantly brought under the influence of God's Word. That's why in our church, we listen to the sermon, and what we do is we simply study God's Word. We go to our life group. We simply study God's Word. When we go to our one-on-one discipleship, we study God's Word. Because the job of the pastor is simply to explain the Word of God. And the job of your life group leader, of your Sunday school teacher, is simply to explain the Word of God. That is our primary job. We are to teach the whole counsel of God. That's what Paul, uh, you know, Paul reminds us of. And... In fact, in Philippians 4, 8, one of, a very, one, uh, of the p- more popular verses in Scripture also pertains to the mind. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent and praiseworthy, what do we need to do? Think about these things. You know, I remember not too long ago, there was a person who came to our church from time to time, and he said, I don't like to come to River Life. 
anymore, or I don't like to be at River Life, because people there are not as emotional. No one is dancing while doing praise and worship. No one is jumping around, except at MS maybe sometimes. <laughs> and there's not much crying going on in the church, maybe except Phoebe or some of the worship leader. <laughs> but everyone else is just like, <laughs> looking at the lyrics. Personally, I remember the most emotional singing that I ever had, mixing tears with the lawai. I cannot even look at the lyrics anymore because my tears was just all over my face. The most emotional singing in worship I experienced is when my faith was very weak. <laughs> when my faith was really almost nothing, and sin was like dominant in my life. But in church, I was like, oh, Lord, forgive me. Lord, help me. But did you know that my experience also, of the greatest experience of worship, I would say the most meaningful singing experience in worship, was not even emotional at all. It was one of those hymns that we just sang, like Blessed Assurance. Wow, it's an amazing song. That song has impacted me many, many, many times. And and sometimes I sing it, just, just use it as my prayer. That this is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. And you can sing it logically, you know, uh, cognitively, and sometimes even without tears. But, the, the, but your worship is so meaningful and so powerful. I'm not saying that emotions are entirely wrong. But this is what I'm saying. Emotions are not evidence of great faith. I hope you agree to that with that statement. Emotions are not evidence of meaningful worship. Okay? Yes, it's, it, it can be a good thing, but it's not a sign of great faith or meaningful worship. But... The lack of emotion sometimes should not be an excuse for the worship team to not practice, not an excuse for them to not do an excellent job in what they do. It's also not an excuse for you, church, to sing when your and your mind is somewhere else. Like you're gonna say, uh, you're gonna sing, "God is so good," and you're thinking, "Look at your time, God is so good." <laughs> you know, or you're looking at your text. Hmm worship you, then you're going to... You should not be doing that. <laughs> That's not, this is not an excuse for such, an, such a thing. It's also not an excuse for not clapping your hands <laughs> or not jumping around <laughs> or not dancing because we are commanded to do such things, right? In the book of Psalms, clap your hands, all you people. Ra you know... Lift up your hands to God, right? We're commanded to do that as well. We're not commanded, but encouraged to do that. So later on, when we sing the final song, I pray that all of you will clap your hands. I hope it's a song that's, that's clappable. <laughs> okay? Emotion is not evidence of great faith, nor a straightforward, logical, unemotional prayer is evidence of lack of faith. So if you're, you have an unemotion, unemotional prayer, it doesn't mean you, have, you lack faith as well. Okay? For instance, our dealings with sin. Think about how we deal with sin. You know, some people, they cry over their sin because they've done something wrong and they feel remorse. But it's not true repentance. You can feel ashamed of your sin. You can feel bad about your sin. But without any willingness to change or to obey Christ. And that's not the kind of crying that God wants you to do. In fact, Judas is an example of that. Remember Judas? When he realized that he did something wrong and he realized that what he did led Christ to the cross. What did Judas do? He felt remorseful. But he was not repentant. He, in fact, killed himself. But let, let me, let's look at another guy named Zacchaeus. 
You know, when Jesus, when he saw Jesus, or he wanted to see Jesus, and I think we know the song, Zacchaeus was a little, wee little man, and went up a tree just to be able to seek a more tree to just look at Jesus. And when Jesus noticed him, yep, he, of course, he and Jesus met. And look at how Jesus re- responded to Jesus here. Uh, I'm going to use the NIV. Um, did I use the NIV here? Yes, it's an NIV. And, and just look at this. It's, it's very, it's just a matter of fact kind of response, right? Look, Lord, here and now, I give half of my possession to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount, Lord. That is confessing to Christ. That is repentance. Is there, you think there's some kind of, Lord, here, I don't know. The Bible doesn't really mention if there's any kind of emotion involved. But if you just read it straightforward, it's just simply a decision. Lord, I'm going to do this. And Jesus forgave him. Amen? And that is what we find in Scripture, right? Then what repentance is. It, there's, it, emotions is good, but it's not necessary. So what does great faith look like? What does praying in, in faith or praying with great faith look like? The kind of faith that moves mountains. The kind of faith that, that God responds to. We find this kind of faith in the Roman centurion who came to Jesus at Capernaum. Actually, it's really, I would really like to pronounce it the way they pronounce it there, Capernaum. <laughs> I think that should be the right way to pronounce it. I don't, the Americans butcher that name, probably. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, but we went to that place, actually, when we were there. This is a picture I got, took, took of Capernaum. And Peter's house was right towards the right, the left side of right side of that picture. <laughs> and and, and uh, Peter lived here, and this was Jesus' home base for ministry. So now you can just see stones there, but these were old houses. Uh, these were houses back then. Probably Jesus walked that street there because he lived there for a time. And, and what we find out in this passage is that there was a centurion that came to Jesus. And we're going to read this. As Marvin read this earlier already. When Jesus had entered Capernaum, Capernaum, a centurion came to him asking for help. Asking for help. In fact, in, in, in other translations, this, this centurion came in appealing or pleading or asking or imploring Jesus. Imploring him. This, this was not just... A, a, a formal asking. He was really pleading before Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, I need your help. Jesus, I'm asking you to help me. Jesus, I'm asking you to listen to me. That is really what this passage is describing. He was pleading, appealing to Jesus. Then verse 6, Lord, he said, my servant lies at home, paralyzed, suffering terribly. And Jesus said to him, Shall I come and heal him? He asked this question. How did the centurion reply? Replied, a certain centurion said, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. In, in, the, in, in another translation, Lord, I'm not worthy to have you come under my roof. I'm not worthy for you to enter my house. Then, but this is what he said, but, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. Tell this one go and he goes. Tell that one come and he comes. And I say to my servant, do this, do this and he does it. Okay, very, there's, you notice there's not much emotion here probably, maybe a little, but, but he's very logical. Very logical, reasonable, trying to reason with Jesus here. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed and said to those those following him, Truly I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. Amazing. All he did was explain to Jesus, Jesus... I am a man of authority. I do this and I do that and things happen. And just say the word and my servant will be healed. And Jesus said, you, this man has great 
faith. Unlike anything he has seen before in all Israel. I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and will take their places at the feast with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the kingdom of heaven. Who is Jesus talking about here? This is a commentary about whom? You and me, all of us today. Because at this time, salvation, the gospel was only first was being preached to the Jews. But time will come. It will go to all the nations. And now, this verse is now a reality today. Because you are part of this passage here. But the subjects of the kingdom, again, talking about the Jews who rejected Jesus, will be thrown outside into the darkness where there will be weeping, gnashing of teeth. Then Jesus said to the centurion, Go, let it be done as you believe it would. And his servant was healed at that moment. God, Jesus answered his prayer, answered his request. You know, this, was a, this is an example of prayer, actually. Because this was, in fact, an intercession in behalf of his sick servant, right? He was interceding. This was an unselfish request because he was actually interceding in behalf of his servant. But one thing stands out here is the commendation of Jesus that this man had great faith. So what are the elements? So what does great faith look like, look like in relation to prayer? First, what you find in this passage, that great faith involves a broken pride, meaning your pride is broken. A person of great faith comes to the Lord in humility. A person with great faith has a humble heart. Has a humble heart. Of course, I, you notice that I tried to word it that way because I tried to put peace in my in everything there. So there's going to be four things you're going to see that starts with letter P. <laughs> where, this is where pride is broken and self-centeredness centeredness is broken. What you notice in this passage, the, the centurion recognized his own sinfulness. He did not take pride in his position. Remember, this was a centurion. He was in charge, I believe, of a hundred soldiers. And he, so he, had a, he was in a little bit high position in life. And he was Roman. He had a lot, probably there, if there were a group of people back then who, who can take pride in themselves, these were the Romans. Because they have certain entitlements. They have certain privileges that other people in the, in the nation or in the empire does not have. But you know what he said to Jesus? Centurion said, Lord, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. And we know from Scripture that God is gracious to those who are humble. God gives grace to the humble. You know, there's, there are Christian camps today, Christian groups today, who believes that if you just believe enough, you will get what you're asking from God. And if you don't get what you ask, you're asking from God, what, they tell, what do they tell you? Oh, you didn't believe enough. Your faith is not enough. You heard that before? They will also tell you that if you just simply believe enough and imagine that what you're asking for is already there, it's yours, you have to visualize what you're asking for. You know, you know I don't really know what they're trying to say here when I hear these words, but I don't think this is a biblical approach to faith. Just believe enough and it'll be yours. You know, seed money, faithful. <laughs> Clay always reminds me, of, just give your seed money, and it will be yours. Whatever the promise is, it will be yours. <laughs> Great faith requires a humble heart. What you notice here, what the centurion did, he simply presented his need before Christ. He simply pleaded, appealed, gave his request, and he entrusted himself and his servant to Jesus. He simply entrusted Jesus this is the situation of my servant. I ask you to heal this person, Lord. He entrusted his servant to the mercy, the goodness, and grace of God. And that he trusted Christ that he will do what is right, what is good, what is best for the situation. 
You know this? He was not giving Jesus orders. He was not giving Jesus instructions here. You know, did you notice that sometimes when we pray, we give God instructions? <laughs> God, you have to do it exactly this way, according to my own schedule. Prayer is not, remember, prayer is not giving God instructions. He is God. <laughs> Amen? Prayer is appealing, presenting, pleading, in fact, in other translations, says pleaded before God. In fact, the command for us, uh, we should not be anxious by anything, but by prayer and supplication, we are to what? In th with thanksgiving, of course, we are to what? Simply present. Present our request to God. So great faith is not about believing hard enough. That God will give you exactly what you ask for. That is not great faith. But rather a heart that is simply trusting that God is good. That he knows what is, he knows what is best for you. That he is gracious. That he will answer according to his will. That takes great humility. Now, I want you to look at how people approach, approach Jesus, especially for healing. I'm just going to look at two verses in the essence of time. And what you'll notice as I show you just, just these two verses, none of them presumed or demanded or claimed that Christ will heal them. None of them presumed that Jesus will heal them. None of them claim for healing. None of them feel entitled to be healed by God. I want you to consider that none of them felt or thought that they were entitled to be healed by God. This really goes against this claim, claim, whatever idea, which is unbiblical to begin with. You only can, you only can claim what is exactly promised in Scripture, but those that are not clearly promised, you cannot claim those. Listen to the, what this, for instance, this leper in Matthew 8, in the same chapter, and behold, a leper came to him and knelt before Christ, saying, what did the leper say? Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. Lord, if you will, you can make it clean. He didn't say, Lord, clean, heal me. Lord, I claim my healing. Nothing like that. He said, he came in humility, trusting that Jesus will know Will 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 know what knows what is best and how to heal him. He simply trusted Jesus. You can do this, Lord. You can make me clean, but it's up to you, Lord, to do this. How you're gonna do this? And this is how we should approach the Lord in, in humility and in when we pray. And this is what great faith looks like, just like that centurion. Another passage. As Jesus passed from on from here and there, Matthew 9, this is Matthew 9, two blind men followed him crying out loud. What did they say? These are blind people and they didn't cry out, Jesus, heal us, oh God, heal, heal, heal me. I claim my healing. No, he says, have mercy on us, son of David. He didn't even, they didn't even ask for healing. They simply asked, Jesus, have mercy on me. If you are going through difficult times, you don't, sometimes you don't even have to verbalize exactly what you just, sometimes because there's no words sometimes to our prayers, right? But God knows how to answer that, your prayer. All you, can, you can be like this blind, this, this, this uh, blind man <laughs> saying, Lord Jesus, have mercy on me. Have mercy on us. And Jesus knew exactly what they need. Amen? I agree to this. In every case, they simply entrusted themselves to the mercy and grace of Jesus. Trusted Jesus to do what is right. This very act requires great humility. Great faith requires a humble heart. Hmm. Next, important, this is, I'm going to spend a little bit more time here, then we're going to, the last two points are going to be short. Great faith requires precise knowledge of Christ. Requires precise knowledge of Christ. Some of us, we have this all kinds of idea about God. 
But that does, if that idea about God does not match with Scripture, is not in accordance with the Word of God, and it's just your idea, it's just your opinion, it's, that, it's just your imagination, it will not help you much. It will not add up to your faith in God. In fact, it will hinder you. It will hinder you. You know, just like that statistics I shown you earlier, that, that many Christians believe, people who claim to be Christians believe that there are many ro- you know, it just implies that there are many roads to God, and God accepts worship. That will not help you if you believe in that. It will not help your faith. It will not help your spiritual growth if you, if you think like that. Your, your understanding of Jesus and His Word has to be precise. It has to be in full alignment with the Word of God. It has to be pure. It has to be holy. You cannot water it down or add a little thing here, a little thing there. You can't do that. Like for instance, some people say, Oh, I believe in Jesus as my Savior, but I also believe that I need to do good works for Him to save me. That will not save you. You have to stand on one truth that it's only by faith in Christ and trusting Him for your salvation that you will be saved. You cannot add like, oh, good works or religion or all kinds of other things under it because that's not the kind of faith that God wants us to have. You have to be precise. You have to be very, you have to be exactly according to the word, how the world reveals. Listen to this passage in Hebrews 1, 3. This is... The description of Jesus. Jesus is the radiance and the glory of God. What does it say here? The exact imprint of God's nature. I want you to go back to the statement. The precise, exact imprint of His nature. Why did God send His only Son instead of an angel? Instead of someone else from heaven? Because only Jesus has the exact imprint of his Father. If you're just going to understand Jesus approximately, you know, Jesus is a good person, Jesus is a good teacher, Jesus, you know, he did this and that, you're dishonoring God. Because God sent someone who is his exact imprint so that we'll know exactly who God is. That our understanding of who God is ought to be precise according to how it's revealed in Scripture. It's revealed in Scripture. You cannot just have a close enough understanding of God. Oh, I'm just 0.999% close to my understanding of God. No. It has to be 100% according to what is revealed. And you can do that because there are things in Scripture that are very clear about who Jesus is, about God, who God is. Very clear, black and white. Salvation is by grace through faith. That Jesus is the only way. That He's the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but by me. That is very precise. No one comes to the Father except through Him. Meaning, there's no other way for salvation. Not Muhammad, not Krishna, not any other religious leader in the world. Only through Christ. It's very black and white, right? It's very precise. Um, now I want you to go to this through what the centur- go, let's go through what the centurion said for I too am a man under authority with soldiers under me and I say to one go and he goes and to another come and he comes and to my servant do this and do that and he does it and he does it the centurion even though we don't know if he read the Bible or anything, but based on his observation of who Jesus is and his life, he had a precise understanding of the authority and power of Christ. That Jesus is a person of authority. Now, what he says, things happen. Things are being accomplished when Jesus speaks. And for us, we don't have an excuse because we have the Word of God. But this centurion who is even, who was a Gentile, who was not even a Jew, had a right understanding of who Jesus is. Having flaws, having inaccurate, or your understanding of Jesus is not exactly according to the Word, to the word of God, it will negatively impact your faith. 
It will negatively impact your faith. After I became a believer when I was 16, I attended two churches, and I was, very, I'm not, I was not just a churchgoer. I was involved in pretty much most of the ministries of the church as a youth. I was in the choir. I was in the music team. I was part of youth music team, not the main music team. And, and also, I was, I was part of the campus ministry, life group, and everything. Bible studies we had uh, uh, every midweek with our, with our uh, youth ministry. But you know, in those four or five years I was in those two churches, I didn't grow as a Christian. I was living in sin outside of the church. I was longing, I was wanting for something, but the church was not filling me spiritually. I was not being fed spiritually in those two churches that I've been for five years. I said, how come? This are Christians, this is a church. Then on my fifth, fourth year in college, I was able to go to another church. And this was a pastor that was doing ministry in our campus. And he discipled me. And all he did was explain to me the Bible. Very simple. No, nothing supernatural, nothing. He just explained to me the Bible. We would spend nights and sometimes in the mornings, I would hang out at his house. And we would just, he would just spend time with me on the Word of God and help me understood, understand different books of the Bible. That made a significant difference in my Christian life. Then looking back about those two churches I was part of, their understanding of God, their understanding of the Christian life is flawed. They believe that salvation, after you're saved, you can lose your salvation, that the Spirit would come out and in in your life. If you commit sin, the Spirit would go out. That is a flawed understanding of, God, of salvation. They, more, they focus more on spiritual experience. Oh, you need to learn how to speak in tongues. You need to be able to experience this healing, that miracle, this miracle. They're more focused on miracles and supernatural things instead of knowing Christ himself. And I was not growing in that situation. I spoke in tongues. I did all kinds of spiritual experience, all kinds of spiritual things. But in my heart, nothing was happening. I was full of joy. But my heart was not being transformed in change. Something was really wrong in those two, four or five years I was in those two churches. Because their understanding of God and His Word in Christ is flawed. It was not precise. And a lot of churches are like that today. And we need to be careful that we will not fall into the same trap. That's why there are groups that we're not anymore subscribing to their music, to their teaching. Because their beliefs are flawed, erroneous. Then you know that when the Antichrist comes, even the elect will be deceived. Even believers and churches and Christians will be deceived by the, anti by the Antichrist. And today it's happening now. A lot of churches are being deceived. Even there's this one Christian singer, even justified his lyrics. He said, in one of his songs, he said, The lion and the lamb will worship the goat. I don't know if you heard of this. There was a video on this. And, his, and, and lion and the lamb will worship the goat. And he justified that goat is, what is goat in, in today's culture? Greatest of all time. Greatest of all time. He justified that. But do you know what goat in the Bible represents? Satan. And you know what lion and the lamb represents? Jesus. How come this quote unquote Christian singer has this lyrics in his song, Lion and Lamb Worship the Goat? Of course, this is, you can check this out. Because for me, it's only secondhand information, but you can check this out for yourself. <sighs> we are commanded to grow in our knowledge of Christ. 1 Peter 3.18 Grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. To Him be glory both now and, both now and, by the, and to the day of eternity. And our knowledge of Christ has to be precisely according to what the Word reveals. Lastly, last two things. I can give you a lot of examples in this, but I hope you, you're able to uh, understand why my point here on this second point. That we need to really know God as revealed in His Word. Not based on hearsay. Not just what you listen online. You have to discover it for yourself. It's not enough to just listen to John MacArthur or listen to whatever great preacher out there 
Yes, you can do that, but that's not the end. That should not be your end. You have to find out for yourself. Study the Bible for yourself. Wag lang umasa kay pastoral. Wag lang umasa. Don't just rely on any kind of podcast or the, our, our daily bread, whatever. Please, don't rely on that fully. You have to find out for yourself. Because you don't know what are those. You might, it might sound good. There are lots of good songs that brings good emotions to you. But the teachings is flawed. Yes, there are songs that can touch your heart. But the, the teachings of those songs is wrong. It can more destroy your faith than help your faith. Even if you're crying because the song is so nice. The, the lyrics and the word, uh, uh, what do you call this? The, the melody is so nice. It's good. But it can destroy your faith because you end up having false, wrong understanding of who God is. And you know, a lot of our sins is rooted in a wrong understanding of who God is. A lot of the sources of our, of our worry and anxiety comes from our flawed understanding of God. Why do we fear death most of the time as Christians? I, I, I confess there are times I fear that. Because we are flawed in our understanding of God. The Bible clearly tells us that it is God who determines how long we're going to live on earth. He numbers our days. Now if God determines death, when you're going to be born and when you're going to die, it is in the hands of God. And God ordains that from the beginning, from the foundation of the world. There's nothing to worry about. I'm just going to eat a lot of cholesterol and triglyceride. <laughs> right? <laughs> no, not really. Maybe it's all part of God's plan to shorten my life. But you get the point, right? If God determines your days, then if time will come for you to die, then it is God's perfect time for you. Then you just have to rest, Lord. Regardless how long or short I live, I get, it's your perfect timing. You notice it will remove a lot of anxiety in your life, right? Even if you're in an airplane, an airplane is shaking there. Like for me, uh, this is my time of death. Oh, <laughs> But I know... I'm sorry, you're, you're, so, you're not like me. I'm, I'm very, that's very problematic for me in the airplane. But for you, maybe you're not as, as scaredy cat as me. Then, Rella would, would feel her hand already, squeeze of my hand like <laughs> when that happens. But you know, I can just rest, Lord. Okay. I still have, River Life does not have 500 life groups yet. Okay, I'm gonna, gonna live longer. <laughs> I'm gonna live longer. There's still a lot of things to be done. I just think like that. At the Lloyd, there's still a lot of serving, serving you need to do for our meals because a lot of here, here needs to gain weight. So there's still a lot of work here. Unfinished. There are payat dito, so they need to gain weight. I'm going to end in these last two things and, and quickly. Last, third one. Not only that he had, he had a precise understanding of Christ, that he is a person of authority and power, and he is in control, of course. The centurion also persevered in Christ. He persevered in what he knew about Jesus. He held on to what he knew about Jesus. And really live it out by doing this. He said, but the centurion replied, Lord, I'm not worthy to have you come under my roof. And this is where he persevered. Only say the word and my servant will be healed. You know, he, this is what he believed. His belief about Jesus, he being, being a person of authority and power. And, he, and as a result of that, he held on to that and did this. Only say the word Jesus and my servant will be healed. He persevered. He hold, held on to what he believed about Jesus. Same thing with you. What you know about Jesus in the word that is precise, that is really in accordance to scripture, hold on to that and live it out. Like when, when, when you have, you're going through some kind of worry or your anxious situation, the Bible says present your request to God and do exactly that. Lord, I am anxious, O oh God, about our church or about my struggles, O oh God, about this situation. Lord, I present this to you. I give this to you, Lord. Lord, help me deal with this, Lord. Grant me peace. Grant me wisdom. Grant me understanding, O oh God, on how to deal with this situation. Respond. To Christ, the way, you know, based on what you know about him. This is exactly what a servant did. Just say the word Jesus. My servant will be healed. Because Jesus, you are a person of authority and power. Just say the word. Of course, lastly, this person, this centurion, pleads before Christ. What is pleading before Christ? What is it in, in our time today? Prayer. Person of great faith, faith prays. 
simply praise. Of course, that was the first statement there, a first verse in, the, in that uh, passage. When Jesus returned to Capernaum, a Roman centurion, a Roman officer came and pleaded with him. Pleaded with him. Maybe as an applica- one application for this passage, not only in your personal prayer life, but, ple- but I encourage you to be part of our prayer group every Wednesday. And we're planning to have morning, Saturday morning prayer as well. We started yesterday. We had, we had a really good number of people yesterday in our morning prayer. Finally, we started it. There are two of us. <laughs> two people that showed up yesterday. Praise God. I'm, but I, I, I apologize. We didn't communicate it properly. So next time, we'll try to, since Joy is back, <laughs> she can overwhelm you with the communication. But praise God, we were able to pray like 100 people, even though there were two of us only yesterday. It felt like 100. But praise God. Pray, because prayer is evidence of great faith. Prayer is evidence of your dependence on God. So, what did you learn today? Let's approach God in humility. Pride broken down and selfish in your goals in prayer. Selfish, unselfish prayer. You are precise in your understanding of God and Christ and knowledge of Him. That's why you really need to dig the Word of God for yourself. You need to really know the truth. Of course, the truth will set you free. We are also to persevere in that knowledge. To do actually what the Bible commands, what the Word of God commands. Hold on. And lastly, come to God. Come to him in prayer. These are the marks of a person of great faith. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. And I want you to prepare your cups as we come to the Lord's table for Lord's Supper. Why don't you all rise up? Rise up together. And, And hold on to your cups. I think it's getting very hot. But that's okay. <laughs> somebody somebody will, will lower the air conditioning. Let's take a moment this morning. Uh, we, are, we are commanded in Scripture that as we come to the Lord's table, we are to take this in a worthy manner. In a worthy manner, meaning you don't harbor sin in your heart. You don't harbor unforgiveness in your heart. If there's something that brings you guilt today or any kind of sin that you haven't dealt with in the, before God, let's take time to do this today. Let's do a self-examination today. Lord, search our hearts of God. Reveal any kind of unholy thing in our heart and in our lives, O oh God. Lord, it is your will and desire for us to be vessels of honor, O oh God. Fit for your use, O oh God. Lord, useful for honorable purposes, O oh God. God glorifying purposes. Lord, I ask you. To reveal such things, O God, that hinders us from being used by you. Being, hinders us from fully experiencing the fullness of your blessing, of your glory, of your fellowship, O Lord, in our lives. And Lord, as as we are reminded, Lord God, that Lord, that we are to come to you, to ask, Lord, that for a heart that is renewed, heart that is clean, a spirit that is in right relationship with you, Lord. Lord, we ask for such things. Forgive us, Lord, for any sin we've committed, Lord God. Whether the sin of our eyes or the sin of our flesh or any compromises or any time, Lord God, we, we, we gave in to the, to the world and to the temptations of Satan and the world, oh God. And even, even 
Lord God, our own flesh. Forgive us, Lord. Cleanse our hearts. Lord, I pray also that you give us a repentant heart. That, Lord, we have that willingness that comes from the conviction your Spirit brings, O God. The willingness, the commitment, Lord God, to live a holy life. To live a life that, 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 that runs away from sin, that rejects sin. And embraces righteousness, Lord. And all the kinds of sin we are struggling with, Lord God. Give us that willingness to let go of such things. Even, even thinking, oh God, ideas that, 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 that dishonors you, doesn't conform to your, to your truth, Lord. Lord, bring about conviction in our hearts of sin, of judgment, and righteousness today, Lord. I ask this in your name, Lord Jesus. I ask this in your name. And Lord, help us to be like the centurion, O God. Person of great faith, O God. Help our hearts to be humble, O God. Show us, O God, in which situations or circumstances in our lives, O God, that, that, that pride is still reign, O God, is still rule our hearts. And Lord, by your goodness and grace, grant us the humility of heart in those situations. Maybe it's in the aspect of our relationship with our children or parents or, or spouse, oh God, or workplace, oh God. Whatever situation where our pride just begins to, to, to explode in, in those situations. Even maybe it could be our career, it could be our money, it could be, it could be Lord, our, 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 our knowledge, our wisdom, our experience, whatever it is, O oh God, that we are prideful in an unholy way, O oh God, that dishonors you. Forgive us and help us, O oh God. Uh, run away from it, turn away from such things, O oh God. Lord, we pray also that if there are flaws in our understanding of you, Lord, reveal the truth to us, O oh God. Reveal to us how we should, how we should understand Whatever we need to understand from your word, O oh God, and let it be in conformity to what you reveal to us, O oh God, in conformity to your Holy Spirit. Let our knowledge of you be pure and holy, untainted by the world, untainted, O oh God, by sin, untainted by the flesh, O oh God. Lord, there are many times we justify our actions, we justify our sin, O oh God. Lord, we justify our thoughts, O oh God, that even though it is evil in your sight. Forgive us, Lord. Help us to submit to your truth, O oh God, to surrender to your truth, O oh God. Lord, to kneel down before the cross, O oh God, and surrender to you. Because, Lord Jesus, you know what is best for us. That you are Lord, and you are our Savior. That you are in control, that you are sovereign King over our lives, and we just humbly submit to you, surrender to you, Lord. Lord, I pray also that we will hold on to what we know about you. We will persevere in what we believe about you that is accordance to your word. That sometimes even our circumstance may go a different direction. Maybe the world tells us to do something different. Oh God, we will hold on. We will we will not turn to the left or to the right, but we will go directly towards you. Run the race with perseverance, with Christ, who is the author and finisher of our faith, looking towards him, looking towards Christ alone. I know some of us are still affected by other thoughts and ideas that are flawed, O oh God. Lord, help us to see these things. And I know in your good time, O oh God, in your perfect time, Lord, you Continue to transform us and conform us, our minds especially, to your word, to your truth, as you did in my life, as you did in many of us here. And Lord, I pray also that we'll be committed to plead before you in prayer, to appeal before you, especially, Lord, the task of interceding for others, for our families, for our children, for our parents, for other people in our life, our friends, oh God, loved ones, oh God, Lord, Help us to intercede like the centurion, O God, for his servant, Lord God. That, Lord, our prayers are not just convenience prayer or prayer just because for the sake of praying. But really it is the pleading of our heart, Lord. It is the cry of our heart for our own needs and the needs of, of others, Lord God. I ask this in your name. 
oh God, change our heart to have this kind of heart of pleading before you, appealing before you, like the centurion of God. And we will trust you that you will respond in a, what, according to your will and according to what you, what you deem is best for us, Lord. And we will not instruct you, Lord God. We will not, we will not dictate what you're going to do and how you're going to do it. We will trust you on what you're going to do and how you're going to do it, Lord. And as we come to this table, oh God, on, uh, together as you've done on the very first night when this was celebrated, Lord God, in the upper room, Lord. Lord, we come to you remembering your body, Lord, which is represented by this bread or wafer, Lord, and, and also your blood represented by this by this juice, O oh God, or this cup, Lord. Let us raise the bread together. As I read First Corinthians 11. For I received from the Lord what I pass on to you on the night when Jesus was betrayed. He took bread. And when he had given thanks, thank you for this bread, Lord, reminding us of your body. He broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take the bread together. Lord, thank you for your body broken for us. And by your stripes, we've been healed. Thank you, Lord. And we also thank you, Lord Jesus, for your blood shed on the cross for the remission of sin. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's take the cup together. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your body and your blood shed for us, body broken for us. Lord, so that you will no longer be dishonored, O oh God, in our lives, O oh God. That you will be glorified through our lives, O oh God. Lord, it is for your, ultimately, Lord, it is for your glory and what you did on the cross, Lord God. That all of us, each of us, will be reflecting your glory in this lost and dying world, Lord. As we go out this, week, this Sunday, go back to our respective homes, go back to our respective workplaces, Lord, we pray for your hand and blessing be upon us, your grace be upon us, Lord. Lord, give us a heart that unceasingly intercedes, unceasingly prays, O God, before you, Lord. Give us a heart also, Lord God, that is concerned with the situation of loss, of those who are lost, that we will have the courage to make you known to others, to share our faith to others, Lord. We pray also, Lord, that we'll be an encouragement to our brothers and sisters in every way, whether through our life groups, through our one-on-one -on -one discipleship, Lord, through our Sunday gathering, and any kind of fellowship that we have throughout the week, oh God. I pray that we'll be a blessing and encouragement to our brothers and sisters. And I pray, Lord, that as a church, oh God, let your light shine through this church and through our individual lives, that people will see your glory, Lord God. All glory, honor be to you, O God, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.